The novel, The Gargoyle Hunters, is about fragmentation. It's about a fragmenting family in a fragmenting city, the fragmenting city of New York in the 1970s, which is the city of my childhood. Uh, our protagonist is 13-year-old Griffin Watts. Now, Griffin is... Uh, he's, he's caught in the aftermath of a, of a difficult divorce. He's caught between two warring parents. And his father's moved out. His father is very charismatic and uh, a passionate, uh, mysterious preservationist. Uh, but he's also kind of, a, uh, he's, he's emotionally unavailable. And what Griffin really wants more than anything else is to forge a, a connection with his father. So he allows, Griffin allows himself to be recruited into his father's illicit and very dangerous architectural salvage business. Griffin is very small, he's very nimble, so his father sends him, really exploits him, sends him clambering all the way around the tops of these iconic skyscrapers and unsung tenements all around New York City to literally saw off or pry off the, the, the exuberantly expressive architectural sculptures uh, terracotta casting, stone carvings uh, that were installed in these buildings in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And when I say gargoyles, we don't just mean gargoyles, we mean all manner of these carvings. You know, it's, it's gargoyles and sea monsters, goddesses and kings, pelicans, lions, um, really, you know, sometimes it's, it's the guy at the bar who got his head beaten in. Sometimes these, these carvers would actually um, carve their friends or themselves when they got a little bored. So sometimes when you're walking down the streets in New York City, you will actually see 19th century New Yorkers looking back at you because these guys would carve, them, carve themselves and each other. Uh, the father, Griffin's father in this book, is an obsessive admirer of historic architecture. And really he occupies this, this moral gray area in this book. The question is, is he uh, a great zealous preservationist or is he just a common thief? Uh, or is he somewhere in between? The book seeks to answer that question. I had two main objectives with this book, um, and this actually goes back to this question of the intersection of uh, research and imagination, um, history and fiction. I wanted to tell a very small, intimate story of fathers and sons, and I also wanted to tell a big story about uh, the near death of New York City in the 1970s during our financial crisis. And the book really takes place in the 18 months leading up to the famous daily news headline, Ford to City, drop dead. People ask me all the time what was the genesis for this, uh, this novel, and I think a lot of novelists get asked this question, and it's impossible to say um, this novel developed really quite organically, but it's, it's clear that it had a good deal to do with the really marvelous and bizarro environment I grew up in as a child. Uh, and this environment was largely formed by my mother, who's a painter, a very eccentric, wonderful woman, uh, and she was, a, she was a, a painter, and beginning in the 1950s, 19, since 1954, this, oh, it's making funny noises. Since 1954, my mother has kept one step ahead of the, of the wrecking ball. Uh, and so she, she, when I was growing up, there were these huge paintings of lost New York all over our walls. Um, and, and so I was growing up in the 70s and 80s, and lost, lost New York from the d prior decades were all over our walls. So that meant that the, um, the Third Avenue elevated train, the Third Avenue L, was still clattering down our front hallway in our apartment. I first I lived, uh, we lived in a 12 foot wide brownstone on East 89th Street in Lexington Avenue. Uh, and then it was sort of like a, uh, there were six of these brownstones and they were, mine was this tiny little guy and he was sort of a Queen Anne brownstone, but he was like smashed into this jostling troop of, of six brownstones. And then we moved to the Upper West Side, Riverside Drive and 81st Street when I was about 12 years old. But both of these places we lived were crammed with these paintings of old New York. So as I say, the Third Avenue L was clattering along uh, the front hallway. We saw the 57th Street Automat was still serving up cheesecake in the kitchen. And um, the famous high-end department store, Bonwit Teller, had not yet been raised by Donald Trump for that, his hideous Trump Tower. And actually, um, so Bonwit Teller was still uh, alive and well in my mother's bedroom selling her its haute couture dresses. Um, this painting here, I actually I grew up on, as I said, on 89th Street. This is th three blocks south. This is 86th Street and Lexington Avenue. It's one of my mother's paintings. This is 86th and Lex in 1969. Uh, I was three years old at the time. I don't remember. This is uh, this RKO 86th Street. There's a Sidney Poitier film playing here. 
Uh, by the time I knew it, this building had been raised, had been demolished, and a um, modern building uh, where Gimbel's East was located was put up in its stead, and another RKO 86th Street. Now I used to go up, I used to run up and down, I'd go you know, up and down the escalators in the wrong directions in Gimbel's and um, buy my, I'd go up to the coin department on the 11th floor. Does anyone remember that department stores had coin departments? Very strange. And I would get my uncirculated Indian head pennies from up there. Uh, my mother did another odd thing, which is that she, she was a gargoyle hunter. She would salvage and scavenge uh, these really beautiful and oddball architectural sculptures that these uh, immigrant artisans had crafted and installed in buildings in the late 19th century, early 20th century. And in the, third, in, in the 50s, uh, mid-50s, the Third Avenue L, the elevated train, was torn down, and it initiated a building boom along Third Avenue. And my mother, uh, she became a, a new mother in 1960. And in the ensuing years, the first couple years of motherhood, she, she, she hated hanging out with the other mother. She could not stand being in the playground. She said all the, all the other mothers talked about was kids and recipes and school, and she just couldn't stand hanging out with them. So she would go uh, and roll my sister's stroller up Third Avenue and actually physically oust my, my, my sister, her infant daughter, from her stroller to make way for these architectural sculptures. <laughs> And she did this, enough, and she would take them home, and she did this enough times that my sister's stroller actually ended up collapsing under the weight of its historical responsibility. <laughs> um, so as I said, um, so it's fair to say that um, an awareness of New York City's essentially ephemeral nature, now you see it, now you don't. It's a great big magic trick that New York plays on all New Yorkers as soon as you fall in love with a building or a, or a storefront, uh, it gets torn down or replaced. And the sense of uh, New York's ephemeral nature was, a, was really a pretty big part of my sensibility when I was growing up, whether I realized it or not. So as I mentioned, my novel takes place in the 1970s, 1974 and 1975. And in the 1970s, uh, in New York, those of you, some of you may remember it, was a really vividly crumbling place. It was the kind of place where uh, anything that was not nailed down was stolen. There was literally a famous architect who was stolen off uh, of his pedestal from Central Park, and he was never found. He was probably melted down for belt buckles or something in a Brooklyn plant. Uh, but in, in particular in the 70s, there was one iconic skyscraper that was uh, really crumbling, disintegrating before our eyes, and that was the Woolworth Building. This I chose this particular photograph. This is actually, this picture, this painting, it's an oil painting, was done by my brother-in-law, Simeon Lagodich. Uh, and this is a painting from the loft that he shares with my sister Tracy in Lower Manhattan in, in the loft district called Tribeca. And this, this is looking southeast at the Woolworth Building. And I, this is the angle from which I fell in love with the Woolworth Building in the early 90s. Um, when I was in graduate school, I used to restore frames. They, they had an antique frame gallery, they still do. At the time, they were running it out of their loft, doing um, antique frame restoration of, of uh, gold frames for museums like the Met and, and high-end collectors. And I would restore these frames, but I came in and I fell in love with this building uh, because that, the, the Woolworth Building is a, it was built in 1913. It was the tallest building in the, in the world at the time, 19, uh, it was 60 stories. And it has this really beautiful textured facade. And it's such an intricate facade that it, it actually changes moods in different um, weather and different seasons. And it sort of became my version of Monet's uh, haystacks, the way it would change its personality in different uh, lights and under different conditions. So I actually, when it came time to write The Gargoyle Hunters, I was determined to set a scene at the top, right up here on the uh, ornamented crown of this vivid cloud scraper. I wanted to, I, I felt that there must be some gargoyles up there, and I wanted the father and son to climb up there and try to steal a gargoyle off the top of that building. This photograph, or this image, is actually the frontispiece of my novel. Uh, it, I think it's quite beautiful, but it's not intended to be beautiful. This was actually a technical manual. This is, it was called Architectural Terracotta Standard Construction, and this was uh, published in 1914. So this was state of the art at the time. The, um, the Woolworth Building was built in 13, 1913. This is 1914. This is how the, the gargoyles would have, uh, made of terracotta would have been installed in the Woolworth Building. And in particular, the one that, uh, that is at the centerpiece of the section I'm going to read to you is very much like this guy on the top who's jutting out here at this 45 degree angle. 
This uh, diagram shows you that the way this guy is installed into the building is he's got a nut and bolt in his mouth, and he's got a bronze rod running through his body that ties into the structural steel behind him. As I say, this is very much the kind of gargoyle that I was hoping the father and son, Griffin and his dad, would try to steal in the gargoyle hunters. Um, they don't call it stealing, they call it liberating. They're liberating the, uh, the, the gargoyle from its native habitat. Um, but so to research this, uh, you know, if I'd been, if it was a made up building, I'd make it up. I'd be perfectly content to make up a, a building from 1913 based on what I know about architecture of the period. But this is a, uh, you're historians and I'm a journalist and I, as a New Yorker and a journalist, I felt I wanted to get my facts right. Uh, and I wanted to write a scene so uh, authentic and authoritative that even somebody who knew the building like the back of their hands would say, you know, Yes, that could happen, the way he described it could happen. So I, what I did was I, I got in touch with, I found people who had worked on a massive restoration job that was done on the terracotta facade of the Woolworth Building in the 1970s. And my main source was a fellow called Tim Allenbrook. He was a preservation architect. He spent three years on and off the scaffolds of the Woolworth Building in the 70s. And what I wanted most of all from Tim, I wanted to anchor my imagination, anchor my flights of fancy in, in fact. And so, but what I really wanted most of all was some photographs uh, so that I could just, I could envision it and, and imagine my way into the scene for my characters. And so I, I interviewed, you know, Tim over many years actually. But in, in our first interview, it was about an hour in and I kind of timidly said, you know, my fantasy was that maybe he'd have a snapshot or two. And I said, Tim, might you have a, one photograph, a snapshot, anything that was taken at the top of the Woolworth Building in the 70s? And he said, John, as a matter of fact, I have an entire PowerPoint presentation of how we did the restoration of the Woolworth Building in the 70s. I would be very happy to show it to you. It's full of photographs. And so that was a great gift to me as a novelist. And some of the uh, images I'm going to show you later are from that PowerPoint presentation. They're from uh, the, you know, the, the, the survey they did in the 70s uh, of the Woolworth Building to see what terrible shape it is. It was in. Uh, so the Woolworth Building here it is around the you know the uh, around its initial birthday. Uh, it was this is around 1913 when the building was put up. The building and that's this here is the general post office. This is um, Park Place. This is right in here would be City Hall Park and City Hall is sort of in the middle of the stage here and Brooklyn Bridge is behind me over here and that's the west uh, that's the Hudson River back there and those are the piers. Um, the building, the Woolworth Building was opened with dazzling showmanship in 1913. And unlike, it was the tallest building in the world at 60 stories. And unlike today, when tall buildings, we have these super tall buildings going up in, uh, in Manhattan now on 57th Street, 59th Street, that area. And now people bitch and moan when these buildings go up. They say, oh, it's too tall and it's blocking the sunlight and all of very legitimate concerns. But back then, no, people were quite excited about this building. I think it was seen as a, uh, a symbol of American, um, you know, corporate might and ingenuity and, you know, technological prowess, frankly. It was quite an extraordinary thing to build a 60-story skyscraper. Uh, and so people thronged uh, Lower Broadway on the day it was open. They thronged City Hall Park at night. And the building, I say it was open with dazzling showmanship because President Woodrow Wilson flicked a switch in the White House, and in one moment, the entire building was illuminated with 80,000 light bulbs. And everybody went crazy. They were, you know, it was on the cover, cover all the newspapers. Everyone was applauding. Uh, but the, the building is, of course, not just famous uh, as, as having been the tallest building in the world. It's also famous for its really soaring, flamboyant, gothic terracotta facade. This guy is on the 55th floor in 1912 when the building's about to be completed. Um, terracotta. Uh, is a, it's it te technically terracotta means burnt clay in uh, Italian, and it's a, it's, it's a fired clay that's cast from plaster molds. The architect of this building, Cass Gilbert, said that he chose terracotta because he wanted to clothe the building with beauty. He wanted to give the great city the great building it deserved, and I, I, think, he, I think he was successful. And the father, Griffin's father in this book, also thinks he was successful. And that's why he's so uh, zealous and obsessed with saving every scrap of this building um, in the 70s when, when pieces of it seemed to be going missing. 
But it must also be said that as beautiful as terracotta is, uh, it was this terracotta on the Woolworth building was always as much of a curse as a blessing for the owners of the building. And in fact, the terracotta began to fail almost from the moment it was put on the building. There is actually a letter from 1913 uh, that the, the guy who currently manages the Woolworth building, Roy Suskin, has found in which uh, Frank Woolworth, the, the owner and founder of the Woolworth Company, writes to Cass Gilbert, the architect, and says, you know, what the hell? The, the terracotta is already cracking. This building's less than a year old. Can you do something about it? The focus of the scene I'm going to read to you tonight is these things are called Tyrells here. And what is a Tyrell? The ter a Tyrell, I think of them as the jewels of the Woolworth's crown. Uh, there are four Tyrells. They're little, you know, it's French. It just means little towers. But there's, a, there's four of these on each corner. And um, they're really the most intricate, beautiful part of the building. They are just vividly ornamented in a, a, a really beautiful terracotta in a rising rhythm of textures and colors. Each one of these is about five or six stories tall. And just to understand its structure, its structure is like, I'd say, a white asparagus. It's got a tall shaft, five or six stories, and a conical tip. Uh, what many people don't know is uh, three of these four tourelles were actually, they're closed at the top because they're purely ornamental. And they're ornamented with this vivid, beautiful terracotta uh, in Gothic forms. Uh, but the one on the northeastern corner, which is uptown, it's on Broadway, it's overlooking City Hall, it's overlooking the Brooklyn Bridge, the municipal building, that one's open at the top. And actually, after 9-11, uh, there were all these conspiracy theories. You can go online and find them. People, this is, the, the Woolworth building is only a few blocks from ground zero. And people believed that this open top of, this, of the northeastern Terrell was actually a missile silo that sent missiles over the, uh, the World Trade Center, which of course is absurd. Uh, the, the true story about why that's open the top is, is almost as interesting, which is the reason it was open at the top is that it was entirely functional. Uh, it was a chimney. It was the top of the tallest chimney in the world. It was the top of a seven, there was a coal furnace in the basement, and it's the top of a 700-foot chimney. And every day in winter, 1,500 pounds of coal soot would blast out of the top of this Terrell all over the top of this gorgeous, one-of-a-kind uh, architectural masterpiece, destroying it. It away complete uh, large chunks of the pyramidal copper roof and totally soiled the top of the building. And by 1928 and 1929, the top of the Woolworth building was almost pitch black. So what did they do? They cleaned it. They found these guys, these crazy guys, with no support, no protective harnesses whatsoever, who would climb, swing around on this thing like monkeys. Look at this guy here. There, he's standing up here on the 58th story. He's standing on this little outcropping here. There's no hidden uh, rope or anything keeping him safe. He's just climbing around up there. And here are the gargoyles. This is one of these gargoyles is, uh, uh, th these gargoyles are very much the, the same kind that, the, that Griffin is going to try to steal in the, in the section I'm about to read to you. So the Woolworth Company killed, uh, cleaned this building. And so they decided they might as well get a publicity stunt, stunt out of it. So in 1931, they cooperated in a newsreel. Cleaning the Woolworth Building calls for men who are on top of their profession, ho, ho, ho. And if you have vertigo, look away. I love these guys, but they're, they're mugging a little bit. I don't think they're really cleaning. They're just mugging for the camera. You'll start to see they start to lean out just to make us all sick to our stomachs. <laughs> yeah, you missed a spot, right? <laughs> oh, geez. Don't tell OSHA about this. That thing that looks like a child's swing is called a bosun's chair. That's what they use. They used that for decades to uh, clean the Woolworth building. So that was 1931. We jump ahead to 1970s. That's the same Terrell that you saw all spanking new and white in the, in the late 20s. So it was horribly damaged in the intervening decades. And basically, um, in a nutshell, what happened was that the uh, moisture got into the mortar joints between the pieces of terracotta. 
Uh, it froze, it would start to ex uh, exert pressure and push the terracotta out. Then the moisture in turn uh, would rust the steel beh backing behind the terracotta. Steel, when it corrodes, expands to seven times its normal size. So the terracotta facade of this building was under enormous stress. It's like if I, the buttons on your shirt, if you yank your shirt and the buttons wanna pop off, there was a real danger of pieces actually falling off the building and clobbering the pedestrians down below on Broadway. And so they actually adopted, they went around the building um, putting all these really idiosyncratic protective measures on all the loose pieces. And this is one of my favorites. If you look closely, this gargoyle is actually wearing a leash. That's a copper leash they fitted around his neck up to a bolt there. And the idea here is that if this guy happens to fall off the building, well, um, that leash is supposed to keep him from falling down and pulverizing the poor bystanders or pedestrians on the on scurrying by on Lower Broadway. Um, the, it, as you can see, the building was clearly in desperate need of rescue. Uh, the facade was, the whole thing really was in danger of, of being lost. And there were internal discussions uh, in the Woolworth Company about stripping the whole building of its terracotta, and we're very lucky they didn't. They came up with $20 million. It was started out, it was only supposed to be $3 million. They came up with $20 million. They did a six-year restoration starting in 1975, and they replaced 26,000 pieces of the terracotta with uh, precast concrete, which didn't, for the most part, didn't look too bad. But the problem is those Tyrells. Those Tyrells that I showed you, precisely because they're so intricate, uh, it was really impossible to replicate them. And in fact, the, the, the terracotta industry was basically dead. There was one company still in business in the 70s. Modernism basically killed the terracotta industry. If you think about it, um, applied ornament is anathema to the modernists. There's a famous, uh, this famous book called The International Style by uh, Philip Johnson and Henry Russell Hitchcock in which there's a whole chapter, uh, a shoeing. It's, a, it's against applied ornamentation. So by the time the 70s came along, uh, there, was no, there was no more terracotta industry, basically. And so the Woolworth Company did something that um, might have been unavoidable, but still it's somewhat horrifying. They stripped all of the, ter the, the protruding terracotta off of those four Tourelles, and they replaced it with aluminum siding. So you look up here, so this is this very intricate terracotta in gothic forms, and this is the Disney version of the same thing that they put up. This is a helicopter shot. And the most heartbreaking thing of all, look at these things that look like giant horizontal toothpicks jutting out from the building. What are those? Well, that's where the gargoyles used to live, right? So somebody thought it would be a good idea to put a projecting visual element out there as if that would just uh, be a, a reasonable compensation for the loss of the gargoyles. So all of this, of course, does beg the question, what happened to those 32 gargoyles? There used to be 32 gargoyles up there at the top of the building. And I asked Tim, the preservation architect, this question, and he said the last time he saw them, they were under lock and key in a 28th floor storeroom under the control of the Woolworth Company in 1981. Uh, however, and this is, what are the chances of this? Okay, so I, I contacted Tim totally cold. I didn't know him. I was just hoping that he would be able to tell me something about gargoyles. Not only, of course, did he give me all of this um, unpublished information about the, the restoration and the gargoyles at the top of the Woolworth building, it turned out he actually owned one of these gargoyles. Uh, he actually, the, at the end of the project, the, the project manager gave him a gargoyle head. Gargoyles are typically, depending on the size, they're cast in a couple pieces. And they gave him the head of one of them. And he keeps it in front of his fireplace in, in Rhinebeck. Um, maybe you should go visit him, it's not so far. Uh, in case you're wondering what Tim's gargoyle looks like, here it is. <laughs> this is the restoration office inside the Woolworth building around 1979, 1980. He's drinking a can of Tab. That's my favorite detail here because it really fixes it in the era that, I'm, that I am writing about. And then Tim said a year later, there was a, um, it's still there actually, there's a, uh, an architectural salvage company in Lower Manhattan called um, urban archaeology, and Tim spotted this guy's twin in, in urban archaeology with a price tag of 1800 bucks, which is a lot of money now, but in 1979, that's an awful lot of money. And um, that was the last gargoyle, that was the only gargoyle, surviving gargoyle I knew about until last fall. 
And I had another source on this book who was incredibly helpful and generous with his time named Roy Suskin. And I, I joke that Roy owns the Woolworth building, but he, he doesn't own it, but he basically runs it. He's been, ever since the Whitcoff group bought the Woolworth building in 1998, Roy has been uh, managing it. And he, uh, I went to visit him, and Roy is this really wonderful, crusty character with a, with a heart of gold, very, very generous with his time and his resources, and he adores the Woolworth building. Uh, you know, it's the way, uh, the way a captain or a first mate might love a ship. This, uh, Roy loves the Woolworth building. And I went to see him in the fall, and Roy is a bit of a hoarder, let's say. He's got 100 years of Woolworth documents, and he's got 45,000 photographs of the Woolworth building. And he's a hoarder. And as I, uh, any of you guys remember the, uh, the Collier brothers, the famous New York City hoarders uh, who died amidst, amidst all of their debris? Well, um, Roy, they would, sorry, they, they would feel quite at home, actually, in Roy's office here. This is Roy's office. And last fall, he was generously looking on his laptop or on his desktop computer for some images for my research. And my mind, my eye wandered up to a shelf high on the wall. And what should I spot up there but another gargoyle? This is the 20th floor office uh, of the Woolworth building. And that's another twin uh, gargoyle to the one, or a triplet, I guess, at this point, uh, of the gargoyle that, that Tim has upstate and that one in the salvage shop. So this is actually the end of the uh, fact portion of the evening. And what I'm now going to do to you, uh, do for you, do to you, I'm going to inflict upon you my prose. Uh, I, I'm going to read, uh, I'm going to show you what my imagination did with um, all this research. Uh, this, it's, a, it's actually a full chapter. I, I don't have time to read it. Uh, but what happens in the chapter is that is, uh, it, is, it is the day, is the evening, when there's only one gargoyle left on the Woolworth building. All the others have been destroyed by the demolition contractors. And Griffin's obsessive, manic father is dead set, hell bent on getting, rescuing, which means stealing, that last gargoyle off the Woolworth building, jutting out over, over Lower Broadway. So he, he rousts poor Griffin from bed in the middle of the night. They break into the Woolworth building. They go up the elevator. They climb out the 53rd story window. They climb around this 18 inch wide ledge around the 53rd floor. And the, 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 the tension builds, the scene builds as, as Griffin's father keeps putting him in increasingly greater jeopardy until finally Griffin is up on the top of this Tyrell, and it's actually the one that's a smokestack. So on one side of him is a 700-foot chimney drop. If he falls in there, he falls 700 feet. And on the other side is Lower Broadway. He's going to fall 53 stories. There's scaffolding coming up the outside of the building, and Griffin's father is on that scaffolding. And he's actually belaying Griffin like a mountain climber. The, the, the scaffolding is about 15 feet below Griffin, so it, it affords no protection or support for him. Uh, and the father's belaying him. There's a rope that goes from his father up to the top of that Tyrell where there's a pulley, comes down and actually ties into Griffin's belt, the back of his pants. And Griffin's father first has him saw around the neck of that gargoyle with a circular saw. And gar uh, terracotta is hollow. It's built hollow. So once he saw it around the outside of the, all the way the circumference of the neck, there, the only thing holding that gargoyle onto the building is that bronze rod I was telling you about before. So now uh, Griffin's father tells him what he needs to do is take this saw called a sawzall, which is this great long saw with nasty, vicious teeth uh, that has a reciprocal blade that goes back and forth. And Griffin says that it makes a sound that goes zhika, zhika, zhika when, it, when it's fired up. Um, Now this sawzall is jerkier than the circular saw, Dad called up from the scaffold planking. So to get better leverage, you're going to want to lock the blade in the on position by hitting a little button above the trigger with your thumb. Then you're just going to ease the blade into that cut you've already made. When you're ready, just put a little extra pressure on that top handle with your left hand and guide the blade slowly down onto the rod. When you've cut all the way through, that chain leash should keep the gargoyle from falling very far. By the time I was comfortable with my angle and balance, my head was tipped down so far that I could feel the blood thumping in my temples. Don't worry, lean over as far as you need to, Dad said. I've got you. And he did, too. <laughs>
I could feel the rope's reassuring tug on the back of my harness, could see him below me playing out more rope as I stretched down to get my left palm in good position on top of the sawzall. I eased the blade into the slot on the gargoyle's neck the way he'd told me, squeezed the th trigger, and thumbed the blade lock. Right away, I could tell something was wrong. I'd forgotten you're supposed to turn on a saw before making contact with the thing you're cutting. And as soon as that crazy jigga jigga blade started trying to jerk up and down, I realized it was fighting me and fighting the gargoyle too. The blade was jammed in that slot, and it didn't like it. To try to loosen it, I leaned farther off the building and shoved down with my left hand driving hard from my elbow. At first, the saw didn't dislodge, just struggled further, its motor growling, all that pugnacious, herky-jerky energy transferring not to the blade, but up through my hands and arms, causing me to shift my weight abruptly to keep from falling. Maybe that sudden movement bent the blade or jogged something loose, or both. But for one quick moment, the sawzall seemed to move as it should, its blade sliding down into the slot, sawing rhythmically up and down, until I felt it jolt against the rod, felt it catch and stutter, and then kick back toward me with startling violence, the butt of the saw handle smashing me in the shoulder and knocking me off balance. I was falling then, tumbling sideways right off the building, dropping the sawzall to throw my arms around the gargoyle's long neck, a lunge of desperation that seemed, remarkably, to stop my fall until I felt that wonderful abrupt tug at my waist and realized that it was not the gargoyle, but Dad who was supporting me, holding strong at the other end of the rope that connected me to him. In that moment, practically strangling the gargoyle with my arms in my confusion of desperation and gratitude, I saw the saws all dropping toward the scaffold beneath me, its jagged teeth sawing the air. It didn't hit Dad. It landed on the planking a couple of feet from him, but with its blade still pumping fiercely back and forth, it skittered wildly across the wood toward his ankles, forcing him to leap out of its path. There was no way he could have held on to that rope. I felt it go limp at my waist, felt the burden of my own weight grow suddenly enormous on the gargoyle. I gripped him tighter in my desperation, heaving my skinny chest farther up onto his skinny neck, which, to my amazement, remained attached to the building. Then, slowly, almost serenely, the skyline creature began dipping his head toward the street. There was a contemplativeness to his movement, a deliberation, until his neck snapped cleanly at the cut I'd made, the little chain leash yanked right out of the wall, and I was plummeting through the open air toward the street, hugging this useless, dragon-eared hunk of terracotta to my chest. And that, I think, is what you call a cliffhanger. 